Hey there students! Last night I did a live hangout with Dr. Sadler on the Scientific Revolution and the Enlightenment and some questions came up and one of the questions was what is the difference between the Scientific Revolution and the Enlightenment? How could we compare the two? Because a lot of times they get sort of confounded because we say the Scientific Revolution, the Enlightenment, there are a lot of values that are shared. What do they have in common? What are the differences? How do we distinguish the two? Quick shout out to Alexandra Perez who might actually be my number one fan. There are people who claim that, but she's actually my number one follower on Instagram and all of that kind of stuff. Much appreciated. So shout out to Alexandria and her AP Euro class. And so the Scientific Revolution and the Enlightenment compared. And I'm going to put up a graphic organizer here. I love graphic organizers. It's graphic organizer time. It's always graphic organizer time. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a quick comparison of the Scientific Revolution and the Enlightenment. So first of all, the time frame. The Scientific Revolution went from about 1543 when Copernicus posthumously published his work on heliocentrism to 1687, the publication of Newton's work. All right, so about a 17th century phenomenon, whereas the Enlightenment is more focused on the 18th century. A lot of uh, arbitrary estimates about 1715 to 1789, the start of the French Revolution. So first of all, the scientific revolution precedes the Enlightenment, comes before it. And while it's coming before it, it's kind of like you could think of maybe John the Baptist and Jesus or something like that. Now, of course, that is a very curious analogy to use when we're talking about the Enlightenment. So the scientific revolution laid the foundation for this new new scientific thinking, whereas the Enlightenment is built on the foundation that is laid by the scientific revolution. So no scientific revolution, no enlightenment as we know it, because the philosophes of the enlightenment depended on a lot of the thinking of the scientific revolution, that we live in a rational universe governed by natural law, and that we have this scientific way of thinking that we default to doubt rather than faith. Empiricism is a value of the scientific revolution that carries into the Enlightenment that we should believe what we observe and what we experience rather than just what we are taught. As far as the scientific revolution, scientific inquiry was really for its own sake because you look at Francis Bacon, all right? So here's the guy that came up with inductive reasoning, all of that kind of stuff. And the way that Francis Bacon died, he was doing some kind of experiment involving chickens and snow. Like he was trying to stuff chickens full of snow or leave chickens outside in the snow. Some kind of thing that you're like, what in the world is he doing playing with snow and chickens? Well, he wanted to find out something real science -y. Well, you know what happens to him? He gets pneumonia and dies, all right? But there was really no practical purpose for what he was doing. This was just a man of science, like, let me play with these chickens in the snow and just kind of see what happens. And you know what happened? You died, all right? But this is a classic example of, you know, the type of thing that went on during the scientific revolution, that we're playing around with science. We want to learn stuff. That's, that's what we want. Whereas in the Enlightenment, this is much more focused on society, that this is the application of scientific principles to reforming and improving society. Whereas in the Scientific Revolution, this wasn't necessarily a goal. And then the Scientific Revolution did not present a challenge to the social order, at least not deliberately, okay? Because you've got the Galileo incident where they bring him in front of the Inquisition. They're like, hey, you said that the earth revolves around the sun. That's a bunch of nonsense. Recant. And Galileo resists at first, but then he recants because the thing is, Galileo was a devout Catholic. Descartes, who said that you should doubt everything, Descartes was a devout Catholic. Francis Bacon was a Christian, and in fact, Francis Bacon said that a little bit of philosophy will incline someone's heart toward atheism, whereas a lot of philosophy turns someone's heart toward religion. So these scientists, these natural philosophers of the scientific revolution, they did not really seek to challenge the social order, but only to be 
men of science. Whereas in the Enlightenment, the challenges to the social order are very intentional, okay? So they're challenging authorities and there is intentional antagonism here. That there is a deliberate attempt to antagonize the powers that be, the religious and the temporal authorities, and to reform things and to make society more based on reason, whether that be matters of religion, whether that be matters of government, or whether that be matters of social structure and that sort of thing in the opposition to hereditary nobility and that sort of thing. Now here is a quick graphic representation of the way that I'm envisioning the scientific revolution, the Enlightenment. That the scientific revolution is of a limited scope and it is laying the foundation for the Enlightenment, which will be much more ambitious and extensive in its scope, and it's built on the foundation of the scientific revolution. Sometimes I say that the Enlightenment was the scientific revolution on crack, which, you know, if that works for you, then there you go. But it's really just we're taking what was want, what started as a limited movement and we're taking these principles and we're applying them on a much broader scale. And one of the best examples of this is Newton and Voltaire. When you look at this picture here, Sir Isaac Newton is up there in heaven. Keep in mind, he lived during the previous century. He wasn't there when Voltaire was there. And Voltaire is sitting there at his desk with all kinds of Greco-Roman laurels on and all of that kind of stuff, but he's trying to figure out Isaac Newton. And Isaac Newton is being channeled through Emily du Chatelet, who was acting as his muse. Emily du Chatelet, who died an early death, who was Voltaire's one-time lover, and who was actually much more science smart than Voltaire. So she is channeling Newton's genius to Voltaire so that Voltaire can popularize Newton. Because I've never tried to read Newton. That would probably be a very stupid thing to do. I need somebody to explain Newton to me. So what you're taking here is the scientific revolution, these scientific principles, and you are putting it into a format that other people can understand and a format that can have a greater impact on society than just people doing science for the sake of science. So I hope that was helpful. If it was, subscribe to my channel, TomRitchie.net, social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all of that stuff. Again, thank you so much, Alexandra, for your support and thank you to everyone who supports my work. Until next time.